My name is Ray Silverman. I am the uh, director of the Museum Studies Program here at the University of Michigan. Um, this year-long series celebrates the 10th anniversary of the Museum Studies Program at the University of Michigan by showcasing Michigan faculty and leading regional museum professionals in conversations that straddle disciplinary boundaries, dealing with a range of compelling issues. As the Museum Studies Program enters its second decade, we wish to acknowledge the vast richness of the museum as an arena for interdisciplinary inquiry and to renew our commitment to bridging the theory and practice of museum work. This afternoon, it is my great pleasure and privilege to introduce Brian Kennedy and Peter McIsaac. Brian Kennedy has been president, director, and CEO of the Toledo Museum of Art since September 2010. At Toledo, he oversees a 36-acre campus housing one of America's finest art collections in three architecturally significant buildings. Brian came to the museum with extensive experience in senior leadership positions at art museums in Ireland, Australia, and the United States. A strategic thinker and collaborative leader, he is also a respected art historian, curator, and author. Born in Dublin, Ireland, Brian studied art history and history at, the, at University College in Dublin, earning bachelor's, master's, and doctoral degrees. Prior to coming to the United States, he spent eight years as assistant director of the National Gallery of Ireland, Dublin, and seven years as director of the National Gallery of Australia in Canberra. Subsequently, Brian served as director of Dartmouth College's Hood Museum of Art in Hanover, New Hampshire from 2005 to 2010 before becoming director at Toledo. A frequent speaker at conferences and seminars, Brian is a prolific author, uh, most recently of books on the artist uh, Sean Scully and Frank Stella. He is a past chair of the Irish Association of Art Historians and of the Council of Australian Art Museum Directors. Brian is currently a member of the Association of Art Museum Directors, the American Association of Museums, and the International Association of Art Critics. Peter McIsaac has been Associate Professor of German and Museum Studies at the University of Michigan uh, since 2011. Uh, Peter earned his bachelor's degree from here at Michigan with high distinction, and I usually don't point out people's bachelor's degrees, but he, has honors, he wrote honors theses in both German and physics. I didn't know that until I read your CV. Um, he then moved on to Harvard, where he earned his doctorate in uh, Germanic languages and literatures in 1996. Before returning to Michigan, Peter served as director of the Canadian Center for German and European Studies and as affiliated faculty of graduate studies in the program in the humanities at York University. He has also held assistant professorships and lecture positions at Duke University, Harvard, and the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. In these positions, Peter taught a wide range of topics, including the history of the museum, science, and technology in 19th and 20th century German literature and culture, and 20th century Berlin fin de siècle, uh, and uh, fin de siècle um, Vienna. Uh, accordingly, uh, Peter's scholarship takes place at the intersections of modern German literature and culture, museum studies, and science and technology. Among his publications are the book Museums of the Mind, German Modernity and the Dynamics of Collecting, and as co-editor of a special issue of uh, New German Critique on Contemporary German Literature. His articles have appeared in uh, numerous uh, journals, including uh, the German Quarterly, German Life and Letters, and the International Journal of Cultural Policy. Peter is currently writing a book-length manuscript on the, quote, secret German prehistory of body worlds, a contemporary exhibition of um, for lack of a better expression, human corpses, and has uh, broken, th and that this exhibition has been an international phenomenon, breaking attendance records and sparking uh, all sorts of interesting controversies all over the world. Additional work in, uh, in progress focuses on the visual archive of Gottfried Benn's early poetry and shifts in German cultural policy resulting from EU integration and globalization. Together with Gabriel Mueller, uh, he is co-editing a volume titled The Past on Display, which examines the phenomenon of uh, musealization in exhibition and film. Mm -hmm. 
shifts in perceptions of social responsibility and rapidly changing global environment have presented curators and scholars uh, with unpre unprecedented challenges, including a range of ethical and legal demands that museums openly account for, uh, for the ways they acquire, maintain, and display the objects in their collections. Today, these issues will be examined from scholarly and curatorial perspectives, and in turn serve to probe the complexities of doing the right thing in today's global museum culture. Before uh, turning things over to Brian and Peter, just wanted uh, to remind folks here that the eighth and final uh, Cross Currents event uh, will be a conversation between Bob Greasy and Douglas Conley focusing on historic houses and public gardens. It will be held here uh, in this room two weeks from today, uh, beginning at 2 p.m. This time, let me turn things over to uh, Brian and Peter, and please join me in welcoming them. So Brian and I have talked a little bit about how we want to proceed today. We're not as familiar with this kind of format as with some others. So what we thought we would do is each spend maybe about 10 minutes situating um, issues related to museum ethics from our respective standpoints. And then we thought um, in terms of talking about museum ethics and how it affects um, ownership and um, um, collecting of, of objects, we would take a look at the three prominent areas where demands for restitution have surfaced and you know try to unpack them and, and get into some of the, the details um, related to them. Um, so that's sort of the, the format um, that we're looking at um, here. And um, so I was going to start. And um, so what I'm going to do um, to start is to try to situate the notion of museum ethics as it started to appear um, in scholarship. And from wh what I can tell, it's starting to really become a subfield of museum studies. Um, recently, there's been the establishment of a Center for Museum Ethics at Seton Hall University. There are special issues of journals, um, such as uh, museum management and curatorship. Um, you know that if something is happening academically when there's a companion to the topic um, that comes about. This is my one visual I've been allowed um, here. So I guess um, what I want to do is um, say a little bit about what museum ethics has, from what I can tell, is, has become to mean in um, scholarly usage. And um, in some sense, this is a different kind of um, ethical discourse than has been with the museum, you could argue, since it started to be um, a public institution. If you think back to the way that you know public art museums were sort of instantiated with you know Kantian and Schillerian aesthetics where you know improvement of the self through the exposure to art um, was an ethical imperative and that this was supposed to lead to social cohesion and social harmony and these sorts of things I mean these ideas are still there but um, from what I can see um, museum ethics today in the way it's being framed in scholarly terms is actually something much more encompassing but it's also maybe a little bit harder to pin down um, in some sense um, and so I guess Part of what I, I'm trying to refer to here is this mantra that, that Ray mentioned, that museums are now charged today with doing the right thing in every regard. Um, and so museum ethics, in some sense, is tasked with offering guidance in an environment that has become incredibly contested in many ways. Um, and where situations are not really a simple right or wrong, but you have competing goods. And so museum ethics is, is there, hopefully, to provide some sort of guidance. Um, and that this is a kind of globalizing conception is expressed in the opening sentences of Tristram Besterman's chapter, um, which he published in the 2006 Companion to Museum Studies. And he writes, museum ethics seeks to provide a purposeful, philosophical framework for all that the museum does. Developed from within the museum profession, museum ethics is an expression of the continuing debate about the responsibilities that museums owe to society. And if this is true, if this is a philosophical framework for all that the museum does, it's seeming to become something of a master category for thinking about why we have museums, what their role will be, and this sort of thing. And this is actually quite a lot. Um, 
especially if we start to think about all the things that museums actually do, um, they're very complicated um, institutions. But to start the list and what we're going to be talking about today, the acquisition and care of objects, the stewardship um, function that they have, thinking about the, and this is potentially also interesting from an ethical standpoint in that traditional ethics is charged with thinking about relationships of people to one another. But museums are interesting. They're actually traditionally more object focused. And so there's potential issues that um, need to be thought through here. Um, the way that museums set up relationships to stakeholders, whether they be patrons, donors, sponsors, and all the different employees there. Um, the cultures that they represent, whether they're the dominant groups, say Western European art in um, Western museums or those of other cultures, which is of course an issue that's been under a lot more scrutiny lately. Um, a whole other set of issues arises in the thinking about the ways that museums cover their expenses, how they pay their bills, where the funding comes from, um, and how that may or may not impact the operations and the missions that they have. Thinking about museum shops. What do they sell? Where do they source the things that they sell? What do they do with the profits? Um, there's a whole other discussion about museums and the environment, sustainability. I mean, and I'm, I could go on and on, but I mean, maybe you can see that there's actually a huge terrain here in thinking about what museums done. And in theory, museum ethics is supposed to help us think about all of those sorts of things. Um, so what I wanted to move to is to, to say, um, the issue of museum ethics is also potentially, I think, um, a challenging one in the sense that such a framework um, and would want to talk some, say something about the sort of stable values that museums come to represent. You know, are they you know democratic? Do they provide moral uplift, education, this sort of thing? But they're also um, supposed to um, say something about the way museums can change, how they change, um, how they should change, um, and so finding the categories and the, the terms that, that help us do that um, is difficult. One of the terms that um, has come up that has gotten a certain amount of currency is the notion of the public trust. Um, but even that, I think, can be framed different ways. Um, but uh, maybe we, I don't know if you want to say anything about that or not, but um, it's certainly um, one of the terms that has risen in the debates. Um, but as, as um, Bertram's statement that I read just a second ago makes clear, um, a good deal of change has been happening. And I want to point to just two areas um, as I round out my comments. Um, one is, um, as Bertram says, um, within the field itself. So the way that the museum profession has developed and specialized um, is certainly something that um, is directly related to the rise of museum ethics. Um, then the first ethics codes appear in the 1920s. What's really remarkable is in the last 30 years, the get revised with increasing frequency. Um, and um, I'm not going to say um, a great deal more about that. I'm, I'm thinking that Brian may have much more insightful things to say about the way the museum profession um, looks at these things, except to say that in the scholarship that, that is there, um, there's increasingly the argument that um, ethics codes and law are not actually sufficient to actually figure out what doing the right thing for museums are. The codes um, are now many. They tend to be somewhat contradictory. So we have the American Associated Museum Codes. We have ICOM. We have the American Museum Directors. They all have different ways of framing things. Um, the point is often made that you have many different professions now in museums. You have curators, educators, conservators. They have different responsibilities and, to some extent, different priorities. Um, and very often, these codes are vague in a, f a variety of ways. They're often drafted to reach consensus. But all this means that they have to be interpreted. And so there's a way in which scholars have been emphasizing um, museum ethics is, is a discourse that actually has to um, be invoked and constantly reinvigorated in order for something like um, museum ethics to actually achieve its goal and make it possible for museums to do the right thing. Um, and there are two things I think I'll point out there. One um, is that ethics itself is actually not at all a consensual thing necessarily. It's not sort of a cookie cutter set of rules that are applied and then everything gets worked out. But in fact, um, it is. Um, conflictual. And I think that the th 
other thing that I, it may be something that we can talk about in some sense, um, which is that um, the way that scholars are portraying it, museum ethics is something that's necessarily more than a professional dimension. In other words, that it actually has to be shaped outside museums themselves. So this would involve scholars, it would involve people in the community. Um, and this would seem on some level maybe to be an implicit challenge to museum authority. And thinking about ethics and the way it relates to authority, um, you know, to me it seems like some scholars are wanting to set up a situation where if a museum were not to want to respond to the community in a certain way that that is implicitly unethical in a certain sense. Um, at least this is a trend that I'm seeing um, in the scholarship right now. Um, I just wanted to close off by pointing to um, the second um, area in which um, change, I think, has been driving the rise of ethics. Um, and that has to do with developments outside museums and so the way that museums tie to um, communities, constituencies, and the larger social framework um, I think is important. And I can just really just briefly touch on these. One, um, there have been tremendous changes in the legal and funding structures um, that uh, are out there. Um, and this has forced museums to rethink you know, where they get funding, what they show. There's been a general need to widen visitor bases. Um, blockbuster exhibitions are one area where this has taken place. But um, as museums have succeeded in bringing in more, more visitors, this has also led to rethinking of all sorts of other issues. The second um, clear place um, where a lot of change has happened, and this has had direct impact on museums, um, has to do with the empowerment of once marginal groups, both um, domestically and abroad. Um, and so, you know, the passage of laws like NAGPRA requiring the repatriation of Native American human remains and, and sacred objects um, is one obvious place um, where this has um, come to force. Um, but I think what's a little bit less clear in the ethics discussion is there's this very clear sense that museums have social responsibilities that they have to do a better job of addressing. What I think is a lot less clear is what the nature of this responsibility necessarily has to look like. Um, in a certain sense. And so there's a way in which it's become fashionable to say, well, the museum has moved from being about objects to being about people in some sense. Um, how that transition works, whether that's always the best thing, I think is something that we might want to, to talk about. Um, and the last thing I think I would point to as a significant factor sort of creating the rise of something like museum ethics um, is the existence of critical museum studies and the so-called new museology itself uh, on some level, um, where in the last 30 years it's become clear through historical and, and scholarly study of museums that they have their roots in um, practices that were you know, once thought to contribute to the social good, the aggrandizement of the nation, colonial imperialist undertakings, um, and some exclusionary concepts of high culture. Um, obviously, these things don't mesh very well anymore with uh, notions of equality, democracy, and human rights um, that we have. Um, and so the, the ways in which um, these scholarly insights have led to questions about what to do with the legacies of the physical objects and the practices in today's museums, um, I think the demand that something be done maybe to um, thinking through these things is clear. Whether there's one necessary response in all cases, I think, is a whole other question. So I'm going to stop here and then turn things over to you. Well, thank you, Peter. I, you've certainly uh, covered a broad range of the issues that uh, are confronted by looking at museum ethics. I thought, first of all, um, really to locate it uh, in America, um, we can look to the the first code of ethics that Peter referred to, which was in um, 1925. Um, the American Association of Museums is just over 100 years old. So it got to this idea of code of ethics. It was actually called a code of ethics for museum workers. And uh, it, it, said that it concluded that museum workers um, did their work. Um, in fact, it said the life of a museum worker is essentially one of service. And I think it's very interesting that if you go back that far, this notion of service, it connects to the idea of the public trust, is what um, we're beginning to pick up again. 
Um, so the, the sense of control um, is passed by being in public service. So it obviously is to whom. Um, the codification um, of ethics, the code of ethics and the kind of ways that you can approach it today, um, really was driven um, internationally. And so the International Council on Museums in the 1980s, 1986, issued a code of ethics which really um, it was of the spirit of the times leading the American Association of Museums which had begun to um, explore the issue of museum ethics to codify in 1991. So really I'm trying to emphasize that the way we see it today is relatively recent. Um, the other sort of s framing that I wanted to do was to, um, to um, really think about the idea of ethics as a, a higher accountability. And the idea, the traditional view was that you know, your ethical responsibility went beyond your legal responsibility and sometimes could even challenge the law because the law might be viewed as the right thing to do. Um, and that comes out of the, the history of law. And I think it's important to sort of situate ourselves also that museum culture is a very new experience. I mean, really only a couple of hundred years old. And if in the 18th century you had the development of, of civil rights, I mean the Bill of Rights, for example, in America, you then found in the 19th century the development of, of social rights. So that got built on civil rights. I mean, we've seen the way that this continues, of course, that the year of civil rights in America is really seen to be, I suppose, the 1960s. But the 20th century then gave us two new areas of rights. And the first of these is in the post-war um, situation of the International Declaration on Human Rights. And we've moved beyond that now, especially from the spirit of cultural democracy of the 1980s into what are called cultural rights. So you build civil rights and social rights and human rights and cultural rights. And once you enter in the area of cultural rights, all sorts of other issues emerge, um, which are to do with um, respect for people's culture. Um, and so a lot of the um, type of issues that um, we're dealing with today come out of that spirit. So again, um, relatively recent, and as I've said, 1986 and 1991 are the corresponding years for international and American codification. Mm -hmm. So I think that sort of situates this topic as to why it's become a hot topic is that it's had a growing presence in our museum world uh, in, in recent decades. Mm -hmm. To the point that I think museum directors um, uh, you know, need to engage with ethics every single day. But a lot of it is situational. In other words, you learn about the one that happens to you. <laughs> I mean, so in other words, if you're not dealing with, um, for example, um, human rem remains of Native American peoples or indigenous peoples throughout the world, you won't be as up on NAGPRA or, or on those issues as you might be otherwise. Yeah. Um, there's a sense of, uh, I think, moral obligation. And ethics, per se, is a, um, well, it's a, um, it's a, part of moral philosophy. That's where it comes from. Um, so I think that there are a couple of broad introductions um, from me. Um, and the, the last one I'd put to you would be this sense to which um, Peter has referred to a literature emerging. But not only that, to a, an advice council. And um, albeit that the different associations have somewhat different interpretations, uh, and none of them are obli obligatory I mean, they're guidelines, right? Which leads to some challenge, of course. Um, the uh, American Association of Museums in the formation um, relatively recently um, of the Center for the Future of Museums, which is largely driven as a website, has caused us to get a lot of information and a lot of reports commissioned um, which are feeding us on a multiplicity of intersections between museums and ethics that I imagine we'll uh, begin to consider in the conversation. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So um, I thought um, I would say just a little bit about um, NAGPRA as a, as a starting point. And I think less because, I mean, as you point out, NAGPRA has had, I think, fewer effects on art museums than it has, say, on natural history or anthropology museums. But I think its rise expresses, in some sense, this, this shift to cultural rights and its, its rise um, both internationally and then domestically as a function of um, a whole 
um, range of transformations. Um, I, I won't say a whole lot about the background to it except to say um, the decision to um, pass a law, I think, actually came from a sense that museums were maybe not moving quickly enough in a certain sense and that some sort of legal step was necessary. But part of what I want to draw out and, and saying a little bit about NAGPRA is there's this sense in that even though there is this force of law um, behind driving some of these changes that it actually seems to have made ethics more necessary in the sense that you're talking about about it being sort of a sense of higher accountability and these sorts of things. Um, but um, just to say, uh, so NAGPRA um, was passed um, in the U.S. Congress in, in 1990, um, or it went into effect then, and it um, recognized the systematic plundering um, of the cultures of, of Native American groups um, and a whole bunch of faulty conceptions that had gone into that, concepts of salvage anthropology, the sense that these groups were dying out and um, that it was perfectly appropriate to go in and desecrate graves and um, to take whatever objects um, were deemed um, appropriate by the dominant culture. Um, and I th part of what this law mandated was that all institutions that, required, that received federal funding um, had to review their inventories, make their information available, um, especially to, to tribes they could identify as culturally affiliated, and then um, collaborate with tribes on what to do with them. So the, the law itself did not say objects had to be returned, um, but it really had to st open up a discussion with affected groups um, and affected tribes and allow them to have a say on what was going on. And it had other sorts of impacts. It was also designed to restrict um, illicit trade in excavated objects and these sorts of things. Um, and part of why I mention NAGPRA in this discussion is I think it actually was instrumental in bringing about a larger shift in museum thinking that the notion that objects might be repatriated as the best course of action actually really started to take traction, at least in the United States, in the aftermath of this. Um, before, um, I think it was much less likely that a museum director would have accepted the notion, oh, I'm going to part with some sort of object. You know, it just seemed to be contradictory to the mission of the museum then. Um, and NAGPRA, I think, has had some really major effects um, and has also, I think, pointed to some, some particular problems. Um, in the best cases, um, museums have in fact established working relationships um, with tribes and um, objects have been returned, but interestingly not every object has been demanded back. Um, and some tribes um, have actually thought it better maybe to collaborate with museums to leave objects on display or to allow them to continue to be studied. So part of what I think the best outcomes in NAGPRA show is that the, the sense that all demands for repatriation will empty museums and it will destroy the institution, it really doesn't seem to be the case um, in, in this way. And there's been, I think, a lot of win-win in the sense that the museums that have, and the, the scholars who have collaborated with tribes have actually gained a lot of useful information and they have new practices in place as they go down the road in a certain sense. Um, and it's also worth pointing out that there's been a whole new boom in the founding of tribal museums. Um, so tribes that get objects back sometimes decide to erect their own museums. Um, and so there, there's been a, a lot of um, interesting development along those lines. Part of what um, has been a problem with NAGPRA is one, it's sort of an unfounded mandate. So um, museums were put under a lot of pressure and to very quickly go through and do inventories to publish um, information, um, but the funding um, wasn't there. Um, it was a very vaguely drafted law in some sense, so a lot of the, the terms were actually um, ill-defined in a certain sense. So one of the key notions in NAGPRA is that um, objects need to be culturally affiliable for them to be then repatriated. It turns out that only 27% of objects have actually had that designation, so the majority of objects that have been identified remain in a kind of limbo. And the, the law itself didn't really give very clear roots for what to do in these cases. So um, even museums that had very good intentions have sometimes been stymied in trying to figure out well, what do we do with the objects that don't, where we, you know, we don't know whose they are um, in a sense. But I think in a, part of what that um, has led to, it's taken 
till 2010 for them to actually define rules. It was designed as a regulatory process, and so the, the agencies had to define rules for what to do with objects. So they now have a rule in place for the last year and a half as to what to do with these um, un unaffiliable objects. Um, and so there's sort of a way forward, but it's incredibly slow in how the process um, has worked. And it's also led to a lot of um, wiggle room, if you want to call it that, for museums that maybe want to hold on to their objects. And I think that has led to a sense that um, we actually need to have museums make an upfront ethical commitment you know, to comply with a law. And there's this weird sort of back and forth between law and ethics that sometimes I think you see happening when you look at these cases um, where um, you know, this sense that ethics demands a higher accountability, it's sort of a question of you know, well, where does that come from if the law itself and the legal framework doesn't actually impart that in a certain sense. Yeah, I mean, NAGPRA is one aspect, and um, the other two major um, issues um, that have affected museums recently are Nazi looted art mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. antiquities. And they're, I mean, huge areas in themselves. I'm sort of drawn to thinking, though, maybe it's from an international perspective, having mm -hmm. lived in mm -hmm. different countries, that what's the driver here is the connectedness and increasing connectedness that we have mm -hmm. internationally. I mean, in pointing to human and cultural rights, I'm really talking to the growth of international organizations. And uh, actually, Peter Singer, terrific um, writer, now at Princeton, an Australian, in, in a book called One World a few years ago, he talked about this idea, well, what do you think is going to happen to the world? And it prompted me to think about um, a comment that I remember hearing in the 1980s from Gaston Thorne, who was the Prime Minister of Luxembourg who became head of the European Commission. And he said that the more economically and politically integrated we become, the more culturally different. And I'm finding that again and again, mm -hmm. that we're sharing currencies, we're sharing uh, languages um, as um, politics and economics, and as particularly for commerce, um, and especially with the introduction of intellectual property rights, and as that will pertain to the internet. There's a whole realm of things at work here that is causing us to uh, begin to engage um, with ethics um, in areas that we hadn't thought of before. In Australia, it's been somewhat in the vanguard um, because of um, exigencies of the uh, indigenous population there um, and the development of moral rights. Um, and again, America tends to be somewhat laggard um, uh, in that, for example, um, the 1970 uh, uh, convention, UNESCO convention on looted objects was signed by America in 1983. It was only in recent years that museum directors here, art museum directors, agreed to accept 1970 as a date for um, uh, by which um, all objects would have to have had uh, provenance. Um, and uh, in Australia, for example, you know, you've got uh, moral rights being applied um, to indigenous um, communities who have rights over designs that they share together because they're part of the same clan. And so it's a complexity I'm trying to point to and which is requiring us to um, be um, uh, really quite nimble-footed um, because oftentimes we're ahead of the law uh, and sometimes we're really in resentment of the law um, and we're required to do the right thing. So the question of who says what's right um, is, uh, I suppose, a, a, a major one to consider. And uh, I like to remark that you know museum directors need to remember they work for somebody. So um, the somebody is the board of trustees who hold that museum in trust. Uh, through voluntary service. Um, so um, these are the kinds of issues um, that are causing um, complexity. Issues of human remains, issues of sacred and funerary objects um, have really only received uh, um, serious attention in recent decades um, and will continue to cause complexity uh, in our behaviors. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I'd encourage you to um, just look to, you know, say websites like the Center for the Future Museums where there's a whole plethora of um, uh, ways in which museums are confronting ethics um, now, whether ethics of accessibility, um, who gets in, um, what do you pay, should there be any, um, what's about accessibility to collections, do we have an accountability of objects, is there really such a thing as um, a latent um, propensity to be useful? I mean, in other words, we have objects in our collections waiting for someone someday to come along and find them useful. Um, I mean, w let's examine something like that. What about issues associated with the control of content? Who controls it? 
and why? And then that's faced against crowdsourcing or you know, community-generated exhibitions that were allowed now. Um, or um, maybe just as one more example, you know, what does diversity really mean today? And all the ways that that would be confronted um, uh, that would cause you to have to think uh, ethically. So um, I'm really just trying to point to the, the extraordinary breadth of this topic. Um, which has caused us it to be relatively in its infancy. But I, I, on the other hand, I don't see any difference between a museum director today and a museum director in 1890 or 1920 having to consider um, the, what's, what's the right thing to do. It's situational, and ethics change. I mean, science causes that. For example, until relatively recently, we didn't have an ethical issue about deciding whether or not it was ethical to find out uh, the sex of your baby that's still in the womb, or indeed to be able to determine whether or not one would have it based on the fact that it might have um, a disability. Um, ethics are, are in constant flux, um, and, uh, um, and that's true of museums too. Mm. So um, I guess I would pick up on the, the um, reference you made to, to Nazi looted art, and I guess simply point um, I guess to some of the um, the complexity, I guess in in that realm um, that that um, has seemed to be in in play, um, and um, I think part of um, what jumps out to me um, on that score is um, the sense that um, historical circumstances I think have presented. Um, many, many cases where it's actually extremely difficult to know for sure what happened in a particular case. And so um, I'm sure everyone in the room is, is aware that the question of lo Nazi looted art has been you know, very much on the forefront of um, museums, certainly um, in the 1990s. What's surprising about that topic is that it actually has sort of surfaced only at that point. Um, yeah, I mean, but on the other hand, I, I'm not sure how many, I think it's 10 million objects are in American museums, mm -hmm. you know? There have only been about a thousand cases, mm. you know, and um, so um, we we get very rightly um, um, active uh, on uh, something that has a very small impact on the collections. Um, but why? Because of um, the change that we've had in the way that we perceive what is um, right and how, when something is as extraordinarily egregious as, as the Holocaust, mm. um, what has to happen there, and so it becomes a case. Um, uh, from which we can learn um, how to behave in other situations. Um, on the other hand, um, it's also true that I think uh, a reasonable person would say that um, we're basically dealing with the now to look after the future mm -hmm. while not able to deal with the past. Um, because in the relatively recent past, uh, certain um, you know, countries have accumulated extraordinary numbers of objects by effectively taking them as spoils of war, often looting and pillaging them. But there's nothing we can do about that. The point, because it's too far ago, but it's not that long ago. So we're developing date lines, which are really within living memory, by saying, well, we can do nothing about the past, even though the past is so much bigger in terms of its impact on the collections than the things we mm -hmm. can actually do something about. Um, now that's no reason to say we shouldn't do it. It's just to indicate the complexity of it um, and uh, how we get um, very exerted uh, in certain directions um, because we're um, developing them new. Mm -hmm. But as we Im embody them and imbibe them, you know, in 100 years' time, one would imagine um, these will be treated uh, very differently. They almost may be systemic at that stage. Um, but for now, mm -hmm. uh, it's totally evolving and therefore very difficult. Um, so we're constantly relying on case study. Yeah. No, I mean, I think an il illustration of, of that is the sense that um, Napoleon is famous for having looted art all across Europe wherever he went. It is now the case there have been statements by various museum directors around um, Europe that, I mean, roughly only half the objects that were looted by Napoleon got returned, but it wouldn't occur to people now to lay claim to them and demand restitution for them. But mm -hmm. um, for cases having to do, say, with um, Nazi looted art or I think certain issues having to do with antiquities, this sense of, of this still being a current issue, I think, is really probably the important one. And certainly with respect to the looted art, um, its belatedness sort of 
ties in somewhat with the sense that there are still personal injustices that have been done. And I think that, that lends it a particular focus where, you know, if it's Italy demanding, you know, um, an ancient Greek object that was excavated 100 years ago, it has a whole different flavor to it than if it is, you know, um, a surviving victim of the Holocaust, you know, or his or her family who is demanding something because that still seems very much to be an act of justice that could still be righted in some sense. So I guess there's, mm -hmm. I would make distinctions there maybe a little bit in Absolutely. terms of the past. Absolutely, I past think they're the ones affecting individuals, one expect, um, with countries. And um, just to draw out what I said earlier though about um, the more politically and economically integrated um, we become, the more we become um, issues of cultural rights become predominant. I mean, if you don't have to, because of globalization and um, the development of international codes and world trade and whatever, you know, use trade or politics um, in quite the same way, mm -hmm. you will potentially use um, your own uh, heritage as a bargaining chip in cultural diplomacy. And so, um, on the one hand, the pursuit of antiquities, for example, by, let's say, Greece and Italy, um, is a writing of wrongs um, which are relatively recent um, because looting uh, continues, but it had a huge heyday not that long ago, um, and uh, therefore uh, rules needed to be introduced in it. But on the other hand, it's also a case where um, a country can um, really raise its own profile about its own heritage uh, in ways that previously it might have done by um, negotiating uh, economically or politically. Um, and that's the likely to continue to happen the more uh, integrated uh, we become internationally. So um, the only other comment I think I would make um, is, and this is just, I guess, a, a particularity with the sense of um, sort of whether the issues that museums are facing are, have to do with those of the past as opposed to those that are, that are ongoing is um, it seems that um, when we are talking about antiquities, then there, there has been the point um, sustained that, um, so I mean, you made reference to you know, 1970 as this date that's been agreed upon, that um, I think part of what makes the cases of l illicit antiquities or looted antiquities potentially also um, a thorny one is that um, the acquisitiveness of some museums, and certainly not all, um, in fact, is at least it's argued that it drives a kind of black market and that this actually um, has a whole bunch of different effects um, that um, are being felt now um, as opposed to um, those that, you know, may be um, felt, you know, in, in cases having to do, say, with, you know, the Parthenon sculptures and these sorts of things. And here I'm thinking about the, the way in which um, a museum that would purchase unprovenanced antiquities um, is um, participating in an economy in which there's destruction of um, cultural knowledge, destruction of um, cultural heritage and this sort of thing, along with potentially, you know, at least the argument runs that this is also depriving um, certain cultures of ties to, you know, the heritage that they have. And I think one of the, the points there um, that goes back to something you were saying is, um, since this turn to cultural rights, this, there's, there's a sense in which, and this has been enshrined in various UNESCO conventions, there's the sense that cultural patrimony is something that belongs to all people. Um, and this um, is something I think that, that ties into um, some of the, the current questions about what museums you know, should be doing when it comes to um, acquiring antiquities with less than a you know, completely clear mm -hmm. record of, of where they have come from in this sense. And I don't know, you know from the museum standpoint whether it's always so clear cut. I think sometimes it seems very clear when you set up the argument in the abstract. Mm -hmm. yeah. But again, you, it's only when you confront the issues to do with a particular object and have to accept um, what point convinces you you know, I mean, how much do you believe that something should be returned, even sometimes in the absence of a complete, you know, concrete case? Uh, that's when you, you really begin to engage um, uh, uh, this issue. Um, I mean, it's, it's very, very complex because, I mean, maybe looking at it um, coldly, 
Uh, we do confront, for example, the fact that museums' participation in the illicit market is tiny in comparison to the scale of the illicit market. Mm -hmm. But it's easier to deal with museums because they're known entities and they're responsible in the public trust, whereas mm -hmm. private people can operate differently. Um, so uh, that's not to say, of course, that it's the obligation of an institution set up in the public service to make sure that it has um, appropriate codes of conduct that would be seen by the public generally to be appropriate. Um, so uh, there's that higher level of responsibility. But it's also true that, you know, looking at it coldly, um, we also have the development of national borders that are relatively recent being exercised in ways um, over cultures that didn't have um, that um, structure. And so um, it, it's, you're dealing with the now um, and you're looking at it um, from a legal point of view, um, driving an ethical point of view, um, and at the same time um, the issues of irrespective of the legal point of view, what do you think is right in any given, uh, in any given situation? Um, and that's why I point to the fact that it's becoming um, so much broader. I'll give you one example. Um, I don't know if any of the uh, art museums in the Association of Art Museum Directors here are actually operating um, uh, socially responsible investing as, for example, hospitals and education institutions frequently do, charitable organizations. That is to say, if a museum is set up in the public service for the purpose of art education, well then if we take it on a body, mind and spirit basis, it would not be appropriate to accept sponsorship or to buy shares in companies that would make things that would be bad for your health. Um, but particularly in America, we operate with very significant museum endowments in many institutions. Mm -hmm. And so to what extent do we absolutely operate ethically and appropriately uh, to our purpose? So uh, you know, the whole issue of transparency, the whole issue of how this is developing is becoming uh, um, exceedingly complex. But it's really a, a case of are you really what you say you are? Mm -hmm. And how far do you have to go to demonstrate that? And uh, the whole issue of transparency generally is affecting every, um, every discipline. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, museums are just part of that overall um, trend. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, questions? So sh I guess we'll open it up. I mean, we've sort of gone all over the place in, in some sense. But I, hopefully, we've touched on issues that will allow some sort of tie-in. microphone here. Even better. Uh, thank you. Uh, fascinating presentation. And to kind of get us moving along, we touched on many fascinating subjects here, but on, on the issue of re repatriation, I'd like to ask you to give us some opinions about uh, stewardship of an object. If, for instance, and in this mm -hmm. one you'll recognize, Thailand demands the Chicago Art Institute uh, return a lintel but it's clear that uh, the, the country, in this case Thailand, is politically unstable. Um, mm -hmm. What burden is placed on you as administrators and actually trustees of a collection to refuse that? And how do you make a judgment about when a, uh, a demand makes sense politically because uh, you place at risk the, the, uh, the bad curatorial practice for the object or perhaps its uh, destruction for political purposes you can't control? Thank you. Mm -hmm. But it really depends on how the, um, the claim arose. I mean, mm -hmm. I don't think many museums are looking at their collections wondering what they can volunteer to give back, you know, in the abstract, <laughs> right? Um, where certain countries have developed um, uh, considerable claims um, and have uh, even gone further and signed um, stipulation agreements with the American government, then it takes into a whole different realm. Um, and I think that, um, let's say, uh, the government of Thailand, I'm not sure exactly what the nature of the agreement is um, with Thailand, Thailand and, uh, and America. But let's say, uh, in contrast, just to use a different example in the absence of my knowing that, um, with Italy where we know that since 2001 the American government entered into an agreement uh, to return looted objects from American museums. A claim can arise 
um, from the Italian government, and then you're dealing with their Ministry of Culture. Or it can arise where um, they have invited the American government, which today would be Immigration Customs Enforcement, ICE, which was set up after 9-11, mm -hmm. and has a division that deals with the return of looted objects. Then you're dealing with the American government. And if the American government claims an object on behalf mm -hmm. of another country, um, in law, they just have to demonstrate probable cause to their own satisfaction. And if they feel they have probable cause, they can seize the object and return it, or you can cooperate with them and agree to return it. Um, and the burden falls on you to prove that what they are establishing as probable cause is not true. And um, you know, taking on the government is you know, something that um, one would want to be very careful about. Um, so it, it really does depend on how the, the case arose. Um, I remember um, uh, a discussion um, we had with a few museum directors where we all had an object that was part of a larger, whether it was an altar or whether it was a lintel, um, from another country. Whether it was South America or whether it was Egypt. And the question then arises, um, um, if the object, whether it be a door frame or whatever, was meant to be whole, and you have part of it, do you mm -hmm. care to make the thing whole again? Is that important to you? Or is it more important, as many would argue, and indeed some directors have argued and books have been published, that in order to, for example, advance the idea of the Universal Museum that it all belongs to everybody, and that in certain places many more people will have a chance to see that piece than would apply if that piece were part of its original. Um, you know, th there's different ways of looking at it. And again, we're in evolution, and people have different um, opinions about it. I mean, I would suggest that some um, museum directors, despite the fact that there's been general agreement in the area of antiquities to respect 1970, it's still a guideline. And there are some who feel we've just got to stand up to this um, because um, the, some of the countries that are claiming works have so many objects that they don't show anyway. They have such a burden of embarrassment of riches that they haven't got the money to be able to conserve them. And that American museums have transparently had the objects, promoted them, published them, displayed them, had conferences about them. And oftentimes, it's the only one they've got of that thing. And so, um, you know, you can have all these nice conversations, but if you're faced against the law, well, you've got to obey the law. And if you don't, the object will be seized. I guess one question I would have, though, is um, one of the things that seems to be a very interesting outcome of some of the rise of, of ethics is, in fact, uh, maybe a greater sense of um, collaboration or sort of creative things like you know the sharing of objects. Um, the, the British Museum has very recently undertaken, um, I think, an interesting you know addition to this sense that they are un a universal museum. They're going to serve more people and having objects in London than maybe giving them back to certain places. But they have a, an outgoing loan program now, where I think collaborating with other institutions may actually mm. be. Um, um, a way, if, if the law is not compelling you to do something, to say, you know, well, could you envision bringing these objects together um, for a temporary moment so that people could see them? Um, could they circulate? There are different ways, I guess, that people have been exploring how you get around some of these seemingly binary choices that would say, we own it or we give it back, and that's sort of the end of the story. A very interesting example of that is. Um, uh, the recent um, publication by Max Anderson, who gave a talk a couple of years ago to the museum director's annual meeting, where he questioned the whole concept of ownership. Um, do we really need to own things? Because when we own them, we get all sorts of responsibilities and obviously claims. Um, but if we share them and that we change the word um, that is used in museum mandates to collect, to, to gather. And so you could gather by loan, you could gather by exchange, you could mm -hmm. gather in lots of different ways. Um, and of course, I mean, I think you're absolutely right, Peter, that what is happening in this development of cross-cultural cooperation, international law, is the tendency to want to share. Um, and what is really putting a, 
um, I think a dent in it or making it um, challenging mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. um, the individual cases that are, you know, if you've got a challenge on one object and it's like other objects, well, you would be very disinclined to lend it to that country from which it came for <coughs> a loan exhibition in case it might be seized. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, you're going then for federal immunity from seizure prior to lending it, and it's complicating what should otherwise be um, a growth in shared experience. Um, mm -hmm. So all of these things are happening at the same time. Not sure where to start. There's so much there. <coughs> um, I, I suppose the question in my head is based on Bernard Shaw's line that the profession is always a conspiracy against the public interest, and the, a lot of the literature you've referred to, I regard not as ethical, but as defensive. Mm -hmm. People are working out the case for what they want to defend, rather than having an ethical discussion. Mm. Mm -hmm. And it's <coughs> uh, sort of a legalistic defensive strategy. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I'm just wondering how, how we get beyond that, because that's when you get into the breakdown of trust, and then you get the claims, and you can't do the negotiation. Mm -hmm. um, although the British Museum started out from that position, and I think has gone, is trying to go beyond its fairly aggressive defense of its mm -hmm. certain Greek objects mm -hmm. to, to a more creative approach. Um, but any ethical discussion that doesn't go beyond defending your self-interest seems to me to be a, a dishonest. And I suppose the phrase in my head is virtue mm -hmm. ethics. You talked about what a reasonable person would decide, but do, how can we get to a stage where it's where a good person, what a good person would decide and how we think through, because you referred to the Museum Workers Code of Ethics, mm. and a lot, of what, a lot of the debate is about institutions and law as opposed to the good museum worker and what he or she would do in these very complex situations. Uh, I'm not sure if that's clear enough to count as a question, but uh, I'd be interested mm. in your comments. Mm. Mm. I, th I mean, I think it's absolutely appropriate in the con um, consideration of ethics as part of moral philosophy to think about what is good <laughs> and what is bad. Mm. Um, and um, there's not really a lot of literature on that. You don't consider it from that point of view. There's a lot of uh, defense. And it's reasonable to be defensive when you feel you're under attack. And. Um, uh, the reason why I think it feels like attack is because there's been such an incredible amount of control. So any effort to actually uh, you know, dent that monolith um, has been difficult. Um, I mean, I'm told even in my own museum, Toledo Museum of Art, you know, there was a time not that long ago where you know, the director and the chairman of the board pretty well decided it. You know. And nobody outside really knew what was going on, so, and there's no reason to tell them because it was totally private. Um, well, it's very different now because we're part of um, this uh, uh, um, big discussion. Um, I mean, the challenge you make, Mark, is um, one that I think is um, ahead of its time. Uh, I think um, uh, you know, the museum director who would want to take that sort of stance and what is good and right um, would have to win the support of their board to do what is good and right, uh, and not what would seem to be very good but very foolish. Uh, um, uh, uh, so that sense of um, breaking down the collecting model, we gather, we collect, we keep, we share. I mean, it's, it's a command and control model based on a model of museum directors as heroic leaders. You know. um, and so there's a lot of change that's going on there, and uh, it's a culture that was built up over quite a lot of decades, so it's going to take a few decades to unwind if that's yeah. what seemed to be uh, uh, appropriate. Yeah, I would only add, I think, that there's a sense in literature I've seen in that um, it's easier to portray a position as ethical when it actually seems to go somewhat against your self-interest in a certain sense. And I think that also lends a little bit of a sense that anything that can appear to be self-interested um, will almost naturally look to be more unethical mm -hmm. um, in a certain sense, yeah. um, which, which is a curious thing. But mm -hmm. And I think we've set up our own situations that are difficult. I mean, we've established institutions where we organize ourselves to hold the heritage in perpetuity. 
So we have this responsibility <coughs> as mm -hmm. um, museum professionals to keep it for future generations, to keep it. Um, and that's the whole construct. And uh, it's difficult to think about it as um, some sort of shared trust with everybody else, as opposed to shared trust with your particular museum on behalf of everybody else, which is the current situation. Mm -hmm. I wanted to uh, follow up on your question regarding what's going on in Thailand uh, about the challenging situation regarding this issue of whether one is collecting things or owning things and such uh, with regards to repatriation claims that are being made from countries that arguably um, are in difficult social and political states right now. Mm -hmm. um, how do you sort of negotiate that with regards to these issues that you've raised? Well, I mean, I it's sort of would answer it in the same way. It, it depends. Um, uh, if, you're, if you're in a legal situation where the law of your country states that this is what's going to happen irrespective of a um, challenging situation in a country, well, then you're going to have to comply with the law of your own land. If you do not um, have to do that, and it's more a situation of a request that's come from a country, um, one would seek to negotiate with individuals if you can find them within that cultural ministry or whatever, um, through the diplomatic channels um, that are, are here. I mean, we have diplomatic representation from all of these countries, and you'd seek to exercise yourself that way. Um, it would be irresponsible um, in the absence of a you know, legal obligation to surrender an object um, to, um, because you don't have a choice, um, to uh, put it in jeopardy. Um, and uh, I think that goes to the responsibility that we have and the situation we've established for museums as protectors of the heritage. It's, we have a sense of guardianship. Mm. Um, so uh, you know, I think any reasonable person would be disinclined to put an object into a situation where it would likely be looted or it would likely be destroyed. Or, um, uh, and one would hope that one's own government and diplomatic channels might be able to um, accommodate that sort of responsible position. Um, it's a hypothetical, but one hopes that reasonable people do reasonable things in reasonable situations, but, you know, <laughs> ain't the real world, <laughs> often. Um. I, I, I um, was very interested in sort of the, uh, the interesting development of rights that you mm -hmm. were bo both um, alluded to, civil rights, social rights, human rights, cultural rights. Uh, that sort of opens up a whole, the, the horizon uh, that, that um, museums um, currently um, move in. And, uh, and you both, st or you stressed um, cultural rights in Austria, in Australia, moral rights. Mm -hmm. And then there is also still that concept of the Universal Museum in place. Mm -hmm. And Peter, you mm -hmm. alluded to the British Museum and how it's, you know, finally is moving into some kind of um, uh, uh, um, cooperative mm. direction. So I was wondering how you both see that tension that that mm. I find very interesting and that is touched upon on so many UNESCO um, uh, declarations of the of the last decade. That mm. that tension between the you know the Universal Museum and how that concept has changed and at the same time the move towards cultural rights uh, um, the, this, the, the tension between globalization and uh, the, 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 secure, the securing of, of diversity um, in particular localities mm. and, and the working with the different uh, uh, cultural constituencies on the ground. Mm. So, you know, how does that inform your practice in Toledo? And, uh, mm -hmm. uh, and, and how does this look from a scholarly perspective? Mm -hmm. Again, um, 
what we agree internationally among countries as part of international organizations has a, an element of consensus about it. What the British Museum might have established in its own statute of the British Parliament is established by one country. And so in the last 10, 20 years, as this idea had developed of the Universal Museum, um, advocated as a kind of central repository where people from anywhere could come. Um, that really, um, uh, well, one model of it was the idea of thinking about the Metropolitan Museum, the British Museum, um, uh, the Louvre, Berlin and St. Petersburg as the designated places in the Western world where we would have all of these objects from everywhere and you just go there. Well, you know, that's all very nice and, um, you know, other museums might feel why them and not us, you know, but because they're big already they can talk big. Um, but it does have a lot of appeal um, in an increasingly mobile world that one hopes is going to become ever richer. The disparities of income throughout the world may make that concept more for the educated and those who can travel. And so um, how it affects um, me at Toledo is there's a, you know, I, I, I mean, I'm kind of be very frank about it. I mean, we're not a universal museum because there's whole parts of the world that we don't have anything from. You know, we're not encyclopedic, therefore. I mean, we're somewhat representative, but not entirely. Um, and the particular model in Toledo is to have singular works by singular artists, you know, unique examples, whether we know the artist who made them or not, from all periods and cultures. So it's kind of the best of kind of collection. So each um, model is, is um, maybe part of a group of models, but there are many. And so this idea of the Universal Museum, the mega power, um, is, is really for only a handful of museums to be able to consider. And one would imagine that, for example, Delhi and Beijing might have one of those places given that they have, you know, mm -hmm. 1,200 million people and 1,000 million people, right? But they don't. In fact, they have countries where, if you go to their museums, significantly most of the art is from their own country. Mm -hmm. So there just isn't a universal model or a history of universal model in that way. Um, so um, this is not going to be resolved overnight, uh, and uh, it's one, um, once an argument is made one way, I think it can easily be made um, other ways as well. Um, there's a lot of self-interest um, involved. Um, I think that's really what we're, we're pointing to. But also there's an attempt to kind of resolve some way forward for us. And it, it's an attractive model that these places would be responsible on behalf of all of us for the world, irrespective of where they're situated or what particular national laws might apply to them in their own country. Mm. My sense um, is, uh, I mean, one of the prevailing critiques in this scholarly world, you know, is in fact that a lot of this discourse of universality in fact masks a certain self-interest and a desire to sort of do business as usual. And I think part of what has broken that down for me is to see moves like the one that I described the British Museum right. making um, as saying, well, you know, I think that there, there are ways in which um, there are potentially creative solutions to these things. I think if there's um, some truth to the argument that I've, I've heard Neil McGregor make, at least you can find videos of him talking about this on the internet. You know, London is a, is a city, you know, where over a hundred languages are spoken. There are, it is a global city in that sense. And I think part of the challenge of the, the British Museum may well be to say, if they're going to have African objects on display that they actually directly engage the African communities that are there and maybe have more of a, of a direct connection to them in these places. I think, um, is it the Horniman in London, which has actually done something much more directly in that regard. And I think, you know, the challenge maybe to a universal museum is to, I guess, deliver on this rhetoric of saying, you know, we have things for the world and find ways of doing that. If it's bringing the objects to places, you know, where, you know, they wouldn't otherwise have them, you know, take African objects to China for instance, or, or what have you. Um, but, you know, to say, you know, if a museum like the British Museum in London really has this kind of situation, then how do you really deliver that and, you know, break down what might otherwise be, you know, a very Western perspective on some of these cultures when, you know, they have maybe options at their doorstep mm -hmm. that would be potentially interesting. I guess I'm advocating a kind of, yeah. you know, creative rethinking um, for this thing to, I guess, try to get away from um, a sense of, of binary. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, th the biggest attraction, of course, is the development of the internet. And um, mm. you know, so these universal museums are now coming into the vanguard of distribution of um, information mm. um, on the web. And uh, I mean, that can be in multiple languages. And so um, I'm attracted by that because um, if I learned anything at Dartmouth um, for five years, it was that um, the generation of now um, d well, it doesn't seem to, on the basis of every conversation I have, privilege the engagement directly with the object over the engagement with the image of the object. Mm. They just see them as different experiences. It's different. I mean, is one better than the other? Uh, that's not really the tenor of the discussion. They're just different. And so the capacity that we have to engage content um, internationally mm. um, through electronic um, formats is now you know, well, it was inconceivable 20 years ago. We're living a revolution. It's incredibly dynamic. And um, so the potential that that offers to dissemination of um, shared um, information mm -hmm. and indeed a mm -hmm. sense of shared ownership um, well, will be seen uh, in the future. But it's already beginning to become important. Thank you both for, uh, for a great discussion this afternoon. Um, I'm not sure I've got a whole question here, but I've got at least a half. <laughs> So I'll start out with it and we'll see where it takes us. Um, it just occurred to me um, as things were winding down that the discussion of ethics this afternoon has centered largely, uh, has actually placed objects at the center of the discussion um, and the relationship between objects and different cultures, different societies, different governments. And I'm wondering if for a moment we can move objects to the side and think about the relationship between a museum and its audience. Yeah. And I'm wondering if there are, if not ethical issues, perhaps obligations mm -hmm. um, that museums might have to its public. And I'm wondering mm -hmm. if you can talk about that for a minute or so. Well, I think the... Um you're absolutely right. Every time one talks about rights, one talks, we should talk about duties and responsibilities. Um, the c emphasis on uh, on collections was, I suppose, that was our topic, you know, um, collecting and, and ownership. So the focus on objects. Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of a museum's assets, um, my own v belief is that the primary asset of a museum is its staff, because nothing happens to the objects unless people do something with them. And. Uh, the buildings and the intellectual property are other major assets. But frequently we think about, you know, what art have you got and how much money have you got? It's about your, collect your object assets and your, your money assets. Um, and uh, so in, in that line of thinking, turning it around to the public, I mean, the responsibility to people um, is, um, again, a, a tension um, to point out, I think, ethically, um, what's the right thing to do? Um, there's been a huge wave of um, interest in the idea of the participatory museum mm. and in ac engaging your public actively in curating, engaging your public actively in um, solicitation of um, what to do, um, you know, the idea of um, uh, evaluation and really um, developing all sorts of metrics for pleasing your people. I mean, giving them what they need and what they want in their own point of view. And of course, the flip side of that is, um, and that's a big challenge to a monolith like the way we have viewed um, museum culture, mm. is what's our responsibility in leadership? Um, mm. uh, I mean, like any other business, I mean, do we ask all the students at the University of Michigan, look, what you want to study? Or do we say to them, well, here's some courses that we'd like to put out? And what's the balance between those two approaches? So I think um, uh, we need to do a whole lot more than we've done engaging our population, especially those who don't come. Mm. Um, but it, we just need to be careful um, that uh, we protect the best of what we've already got as well. Does that answer it a bit? OK. Mm -hmm. And I think, I guess, one of the things that I th I've been thinking about as, as Brian's been talking is, um, I guess there has been a discussion that has accompanied the rise of, say, blockbuster exhibitions, where on one level that you know appears to and to have successfully brought in people who may otherwise not have been. But there seems to be um, a little bit of a downside in the sense that you, know, you give people what they want, but you don't necessarily you know, expand their horizons, or you don't necessarily challenge them. And I'm thinking of um, 
um, a piece that Hilda Hein wrote where she actually advocates that museums have an ethical obligation and a sort of the moral agency to actually step out and challenge audiences to take them beyond where they would otherwise necessarily be. And I think this is, this is sort of the tough balancing act that museums have to have. I mean, you have to find the people and reach them and say, we have something to offer you, um, and then to measure it in the appropriate ways so that, you know, not that they're necessarily, you know, not overwhelmed, but, you know, there's this balance between giving people what they want and also sort of anticipating something that may, you know, also be appealing to them or that may be, um, I guess something you might do to push them beyond a comfort zone or to think about things that they otherwise wouldn't um, in some sense. And so um, I think you know, th there's obviously a challenge there that the people who already get something out of museums, that's probably in a large part what they're using them for in a certain sense. Um, and I don't know, um, over, over lunch we were talking about you know, social media as maybe one way that you, know, you can go and, and reach other constituencies, but it's, um, it's certainly a challenge. But I guess I would, you know, in terms of ethical obligation, I think museums are charged with, um, you know, accessibility and being out there for everybody, but not necessarily, you know, at the lowest level in some sense. I guess I would want to hold on to some sense that museums also have an obligation to challenge to the greatest extent and to lead in that sense. Great. Thank you. Thank you both for a very thoughtful and